There's no single gum like it. A professional workshop includes a selection of quality tools like master mechanic tool sets from True Value Hardware Stores. Choose this five-piece combination wrench set or this 22-piece socket set for precision, fit, and durability. This torch kit includes fuel, burner, tips, and more. Or select this drop forged steel chisel set or this nest of saws with eight and ten-point blades. Get professional master mechanic tools only at participating True Value hardware stores and home centers. Kids like kicks for what kicks has got. Moms like kicks for what kicks is nuts. Kicks has corn wow. and that's enough. Cause kicks hasn't got any fancy stuff. No added colors. Kicks doesn't need them. No added flavors. Kids love to eat them. Mm. You add the sugar cause it's not too sweet. A good kicks breakfast, it's hard to beat. Kids like kicks for what kicks is nuts. Moms like kicks for what kicks is nuts. Kicks. Kid tested, mother approved. WCCO Television, Minneapolis, St. Paul. in a movie premiere as Foolin' Around, the motion picture that was made here a year ago last fall, premiered right here in the Twin Cities. Several of the stars were here, including Annette O'Toole and Cloris Leachman, and we'll be speaking with Annette O'Toole just a little bit later on tonight. A couple of weeks ago, I had the opportunity to accompany 200 high school students from Minnesota to Washington, D.C. They were all participants in a program called Close Up, fascinating program and we'll later be doing some special programming on channel four about the program itself but one evening while the young people were uh, participating in another event uh, i had the opportunity to slip right across the potomac river to virginia and to the home of senator and mrs dave durnberger penny durnberger and uh, we'll see that visit a little bit later on tonight too senator durnberger a fascinating man newly elected senator of course and penny durnberger interestingly enough uh, former aide uh, to uh, Democrats in Minnesota. Democrat, how about that? A Democrat and a Republican. Well, we'll be talking to them in just a few moments. Once again, we talked about Foolin' Around being made in the Twin Cities. Stars Gary Busey and beautiful Annette O'Toole. And here's a scene from that motion picture. Excuse me. Could I interest you in some live bait? What are you doing here? I want to talk to you. Uh, come on, I need I need you for 15 minutes or so. Yes, you can. Come on, come on, come on. Come on, I got the phone. Right here. Come here. Come here. Come here. Come here. Come what are you getting me under piano for? I have all these people here. This is a bridal shower. I'm the bride. <laughs> oh. I know, Susan, I'm sorry if I'm embarrassing you, but I just have to talk to you for 15 minutes. I can't talk to you. Yeah. I need you, can well, you talk to me. I got it from Petticoat. Are you going to come with me? You're not going to miss it. I can't talk to you. Right here. Talk to you alone. Now, come on, please. Okay? I can't come with you now. Well, who'd like some bass? I want to get. I want to start serving this. Stop it! Okay. Okay. <laughs> I feel like John Wayne escaping from the <laughs> jams. Oh, this is insane. This is wonderful. Store. 
Every Sunday, Minnesota Gopher coach Jim Dutcher gives the fans a real workout. It's called Inside Basketball, a weekly sports show on the people and the game here in Minnesota. Then on Tuesday night at 7, you'll get another workout on the White Shadow. A look at the personal as well as the educational and athletic problems of my talented and sometimes difficult charges at Carver High. I'm Ken Howard, and on or off the court, more people get a jump on the game here on Channel 4, where we're looking good. Hello. I'm the divorce bug. I'm highly contagious and terribly overworked. No marriage is completely immune from me. That's why I created this lovely free pamphlet. In it, you'll learn about marital bugs like verbal terminosis, budgetitis, and others. So give an overworked divorce bug a break and get the bugs out of your marriage. Write Divorce Bugs, Salt Lake City, Utah, 84150. Donahue guests are usually full of surprises, but sometimes I pull a few surprises of my own. You know, remember when you took all the pantyhose off the shower curtain? <laughs> say, and you can take these, and you can get out of here, and I'll thank you never to come in this room again, and I don't care if the sun ever rises on your face anymore. And you can walk away like this. Is that, is that you? This host will do anything to get in the act. <laughs> you never know what to expect on Donahue. Join us. Donahue, weekday mornings at 8, here on Channel 4. Jogging can be good for you. Ooh, unless he has a soft tissue injury. And but I there can be ice. problems, including painful injuries. So we're going to put a little bit of ice on it. Okay? Jogging injuries can be prevented. Oh, that's all right. See your physical therapist. And for free information on how to plan your jogging program, write the American Physical Therapy Association. We will claim Annette O'Toole as a twin city, and because after all, she did live here a couple of months, right? I did. <laughs> I feel like I've come home. Well, that's very <laughs> nice to hear. Uh, you're back in town for the grand opening of Foolin' Around, yes. the motion picture, which was filmed from beginning to end right here, Yes, wasn't it? all in Minneapolis, St. Paul. Mm -hmm. you, you tell me, um, as we were talking about various scenes, you said, well, that took place in the old Hamsbury and this was up here. And so you became very familiar with much of the Twin Cities. Pretty much. I couldn't get anywhere. I mean, they put you in a car and you're driven to the location. Yeah. But I know where uh, Lake Minnetonka is and yeah. which direction everything is. And I uh, saw a lot of movies here, so I know all the theaters. <laughs> you know, as I watch the picture, I know that people are going to make a game out of trying right. to guess where it is. Because, uh, let's face it, the way motion pictures are made, folks, you don't... You don't cut exactly on I mean, you'll see people walking out the door one place, and you'll see them arrive right outside that doorway at the other side of the Twin City right. area. Because, but you're, you're going to have a lot of fun just trying to well, decide what we Well, we used two churches. We used the exterior of one church, cathedral, right. and the interior of another, and uh -huh. the little crazy things like that. So You used the exterior of the St. Paul Cathedral and the interior of Central Lutheran Church yes. in Minneapolis. Yeah. Didn't you? That's a funny scene, isn't it? That's, well, it's a culmination scene. Really. Yes, it's the very final climax, and it, it is a funny scene. <laughs> it's, um, it's kind of a, it's a very strange picture. <laughs> it's a very, Thank you. It's a lot of fun, but it's very interesting because you and Gary Busey are, are destined to be married, right? This is one of those marriages made in heaven and uh, among the families from time immemorial. Well, not with Gary, with John Calvin. Yeah, yeah, with John Calvin. G Gary is the one who comes yeah. in and kind of spoils everything, right. and I fall in love with him, and my mother's pretty unhappy about it. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah. You're a socialite in the picture. Yes. And, <laughs> and therefore use some of the some of the very special buildings in our area. Where was the, wh where was your home? My home was the Pillsbury Mansion, mm -hmm. which is beautiful. Out on Mrs. Lake Minnetonka. Mrs. Pillsbury lives there, and she was very careful about uh, us touching everything. She didn't want her piano nicked. I don't blame her. I wouldn't let mm -hmm. a, a company come into my house, I don't think. But we had to be very, very careful. It is a huge company to make a movie, too, isn't it? I, oh, I mean, it's yes. not just a couple of folks and a camera. Right. <laughs> it's, it's a lot of people. So many people are involved. Mm -hmm. It's nice because you get a real family atmosphere. It's kind of strange because you're, you're with people every day, all day long for two months. You make friends. And then you go back to Los Angeles, wherever you live, and you don't see them anymore. It's kind of strange. It's sad. You uh, just said to me a few moments ago, uh, I'm still living in the same one-room apartment in Los Angeles where I've lived for 10 years. 
that 10 years, I'm sure, has meant a lot of time going from casting director to yeah. casting director, searching things out. Does that ever become tiresome until you finally get a break that helps you make that, grease that a little oh, bit? Oh, it does. It's, it's very depressing. A lot of my friends still are trying to find agents. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's a very hard life, and sometimes I think that if you're talented, that's okay, but that's just a little part of it. It's, it's the sticking it out and wanting it badly enough. So, uh, yeah, those were hard years. Now it's nice because people know my work and uh, they ask me to, to read scripts and uh, it's nice. I would imagine it's a little tough on your talent at that time, too, because so much time has to be spent just searching for that next role. Right. And it's strange because the nature of acting is to be um, open to everything and let things affect you so that your emotions are, are right at the surface. But when you go into an office and somebody says, well, you're not really what we're looking for, you can't take it personally, so there's got to be some kind of balance or you just start to go crazy. It's, it's a I have life. always felt that actors put themselves through the kind of gauntlet, the running of a gauntlet, for which they are perhaps least prepared mm -hmm. because of the sensitivity and the, the, the uh, feeling toward criticism and everything. They're least uh, uh, prepared to handle to this kind of thing. take that, yes, it's true. You have to be a certain kind of very weird personality, I guess, <laughs> to be able to do it. But the work is, is wonderful. It's what I always wanted to do. And the fact that I'm doing it and people are paying me for it and want to see it, I, I can't get over it. It's, uh, it's, I'm really happy with my life. It's nice that it's going well now. It's a year and a half away from the time you made the film. Yes. And that's one of those strange things that happens in movies, that uh, you make the movie and then you kind of forget about it. You go on to other projects and so forth. And all of a sudden, there is a there completed is. product. Was it surprising in any way? Um, I think I look so different now. Um, I've lost five pounds and I kind of do my hair differently and uh, just I'm, I'm a year and a half older. Uh, naturally, I'd like to go back and change some things. You always do. I, I don't think there's ever been a performance I was completely happy with. But Fooling Around was the first time I ever saw anything the first time and liked it right away. When I saw it, I did a film called One on One. I saw it and I said, oh, I hate this. This is <laughs> terrible. It'll never make a cent. And it did very well. Yes. So my instincts aren't very good about it. Uh, commercial success. Well, oh. instincts aren't important. <laughs> Performance is, and Annette O'Toole, uh, Annette O'Toole does that uh, in spades in the motion picture, fooling around, and, and you're going to enjoy it from every standpoint. It's a fine picture as well as being terribly intriguing for anyone who lives in the Twin Cities. Oh, yes, that'll be fun for them. A as a matter of fact, in one scene, they will recognize my co-hostess on another program I do on this program, Cindy Osborne, who happens to be standing right behind the camera right now. But she does a, a little part as a she secretary. She plays a secretary, right. yes. I know Cindy. She was great. Annette, thank you very much for being with us. Thank you, Bill. And we'll be back in just a moment. Don't go away. After two weeks of intense news coverage competition and exhausting test of physical strength and energy, the WCCO Television Winter Olympics relay team has returned victoriously. We're proud to announce they were in the games until the finish, getting the best shots, making the right moves, talking to the right people, and using the talents they've worked years to perfect. Watch for their winning half-hour special on Minnesota at the Olympics, Precious Medals and Placid Memories, Monday at 10.30 on Channel 4. I'm Tim Tease, a CPR instructor for the American Heart Association, Minnesota affiliate. This is one of my students, Lisa Johnson. Last March, my brother Kevin had an accident where his heart and his breathing stopped. Using cardiopulmonary resuscitation, Lisa saved her brother's life. CPR training is made possible by one of the American Heart Association, Minnesota affiliates programs in research, education, and community services. Support the Heart Fund. We're fighting for your life. Seems a long way from uh, the Senate committee room where we visited with those young people a couple of days ago, Senator Dern Dernberger, but uh, it's a very comfortable surrounding. We're with Senator and Mrs. Uh, Dave Dernberger, Penny Dernberger, and we're not, we're not in Washington. We're across the river, Penny, where is it? We're in McLean, Virginia. It's, uh, you, you told me it's one of the, the common Minnesota pol political residences, is that There are right? quite a few of us that live out here, yes. Mm -hmm. How far away from Washington? Well, 17 miles from door, our door to the Capitol. So it's a fairly long drive for Dave. 
Senator, as we watched you in that committee room the other day talking to those young people, I got the feeling that you're very comfortable in Washington, aren't you? I'm comfortable in Washington, uh, but I'm particularly comfortable being a United States Senator. Yeah, you, you gave every appearance that, that you okay. like it a lot. I, uh, I suppose I'm lucky in a way that I, I, until recently, I didn't want to be a senator. I hadn't lived my whole life with some particular set of expectations. and. Uh, uh, but I did have the hope when I ran for the job that it would be uh, it would be a kind of a position where I could make a difference, and it's it's worked out that way. You do, even though you are uh, one of the junior senators, you you still have the feeling oh, yeah. that the impact is there. Yeah, there are only a hundred of us, and uh, uh, there are a lot more problems than there are people to to help resolve them, and. Uh, because there are only two of us from each state, we, we uh, become very dependent on each other to, to bring different kinds of approaches to problems, different views from, from a different set of people. And uh, the, the quality of the people in the United States Senate is what's most impressive. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we all have our impression of senators as the foghorn uh, uh, politician type, mm -hmm. but uh, these are rather unique human beings. It's a very unusual city. Uh, Penny Dernberger and I were just looking through this beautiful book called Above Washington. The beauty of the city is is breathtaking, especially in the time of night represented in this book, just at dusk, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It's lovely. Absolutely. One and of the few cities that they planned and then stuck with the plan, I think. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. right. Washington is not a new place as far as you're concerned, is it, Penny? Well, I lived here for a time after I graduated from college. I worked here. Mm -hmm. And then my parents moved here in 1967, and they were here until almost end of 1975. So I frequently visited here. Politics has been an important part of your life, and not always Republican politics. Well, that's eh? true. Uh -huh. In fact, uh, I first worked in politics in 1968 here in Washington when I worked on the campaign of uh, Vice President Hubert Humphrey when he ran for president. And I, when I went back to Minnesota, I went back to Minnesota in 1970 to work on a gubernatorial campaign for Wendell Anderson, and then I worked in the governor's office. And even when I married Dave Dernberger, which was in 1971, I certainly never thought I'd ever be back in Washington, and certainly never married to a Republican senator. <laughs> One, one of the perceptions that people often have in my business is that those of us who are competitors probably look at each other with great suspicion and probably seldom talk. And I think frequently people think that senator, senators and politicians, especially of differing parties, seldom get together and certainly can't be friends. And that's certainly not true, is it? Not here, no. It's, uh, as I was telling the, the young people the other day that the... Uh, uh, there's little partisanship in the United States Senate. Uh, there's an awful lot of partisanship in getting here. Uh, you run as a Republican against a Democratic candidate, and, and you're full of partisanship. <laughs> but once you get here, the issues are, are nonpartisan issues, and um, the approach that you take to resolving them is, is, is nonpartisan. So you get to know each other as people, and, and the respect that you have for uh, for your fellow senators comes from your respect for their ability to feel their own constituency and to reflect that in, in the way they approach their jobs. We've spent the past week with young people, members of the close-up group from Minnesota. We have two young members of the Dernberger family with us today, tonight, uh, Dave and Dan, and of course living right here and near the nation's capital now. Dave, do you feel a, an atmosphere around this part of the country that that reflects the importance of decisions that are made here? Is it, does, does that come through perhaps in your schools as well? Um, there's a lot of people in our school whose parents are working the Senate and mm -hmm. uh, I have some friends whose parents are senators and uh, they tell me everything that goes on down there with what their parents are doing and what their what kind of decisions they're making mm -hmm. and uh, some bills that they're putting into Congress. Do you find a greater interest in politics here in school than you did in Minnesota, say? Um, I was more interested in, in Minnesota because my dad was running at the time. Yes. And uh, 
so I could get into it more there. Now that I'm out here, I just kind of sit back and watch everything happen. <laughs> Dan, was the was the move difficult for you? Did you did uh, I, I imagine it's always difficult to leave a place where you've been going to school and have a lot of friends, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Well, I that was kind of easy to make new friends out. So there was a lot. The school was a lot bigger than than the school that I went to in Minnesota. But I wasn't going to, I didn't have to go to school for that long because this year, the year was almost all up, so. Do you get into Washington very often? Well, sometimes, like, if we don't have school on, on like, some weekdays, I go in with um, Dad and um, just, I either walk around and go sightseeing or I just stay in the office and help around. Mm -hmm. You like politics? Oh, yeah, I guess Th sometimes. Think you'd like to follow in Dad's shoes? Probably. Really? Right. Dave, how about you? Is politics going to be an important part of your future? I don't think so. Don't you? Nope. What do you think might be? Uh, I hope engineering. Mm -hmm. uh, I know, Senator, when you were talking to the young people the other day, they, they were very responsive and had many, many good questions, surprisingly good questions yeah. in many cases. As a matter of fact, uh, some of the politicians told us that uh, they sometimes have to be more wary of these young people's questions than of reporters' questions. Uh, it, it's hopeful sign, isn't it, to see oh, young tremendous. people? Uh, all, the, <laughs> all the young need is uh, they have their confidence built. And I think because they're young, uh, they make assumptions about their own ignorance that are not accurate assumptions. You know, they, they really are a lot smarter just trusting their own instincts. And it takes an experience like um, these two fellows are having, being, being part of a Washington family, or, uh, or the experience that the kids in close-up are having, just coming down here and learning that uh, you don't have to be in awe of a process. It's a very human process. We're all human beings. And, and uh, once they get their courage up, uh, in effect, uh, they do ask tremendous questions. And it's a challenge to the politicians to give them honest, honest answers to those, to those questions. It uh, kind of makes you wonder about the position so often held, uh, held that uh, our country is going to somewhere in a handbasket because the younger generation just doesn't care. Not true. Yeah, it's, no, it's not true at all. And the, uh, I, I think the, the, uh, the way you distinguish down here from, or between, uh, the good politician, and, and I always try to use the, the word politician in the, in the best sense because that's where it belongs, and I think the kids need to understand it. And the not so good is in their ability to to trust young people uh, uh, to say what's on their mind. Mm -hmm. And I learn an awful lot just from those questions. And uh, the questions that these same people are asking this year compared to last year's question, tell me where that generation has come in a year, just as uh, listening to the questions of their parents uh, a year apart tells me a, a whole different set of things about where the uh, where concerns of people are at. Penny, you indicated to me that you have an awareness not only of the program, but many of the people involved. Have you, uh, you you've watched Close Up operate over the years, have you? Well, we've known some of the people that have been involved with Close Up. Dave was involved with Close Up back in Minnesota long right. before he ever ran for the Senate. Right. Mm -hmm. And, of course, Margie Krause, we've known for quite some time. For any parents well, thinking of having their youngsters involved, you give them assurance? Oh, absolutely. I want both, of, well, all of our boys at some point to go through the program. Even though they're living here, I think they should go through a week of, of the program and, and really have a close exposure to everything that's going on. As you say that, it reminds me that we should talk about the rest of the family. Where are they? Well, we have Charles, who is 16, and he's a junior, and Michael, who is 14 and a freshman, and they are at St. John's Prep School up in Collegeville, Minnesota, and we miss them. I bet you do. Senator, I know, obviously, every day, the, the issues with which you deal change, and yet I'm sure that there are a certain set of principles, a certain set of criteria that apply to virtually all the, the issues that you come in contact with. Is, is that true? And if so, what is your yardstick by which you uh, approach the making of laws that will regu regulate all the rest of us? I think each, each of us, Bill, has a, has a makeup that's, that, 
that got put together from education, uh, real life experiences, uh, previous exposures to government. Uh, I've been lucky because I've I've been part of government uh, at the state level. I've been a volunteer part of government at the local level, and so forth. And so I bring those those uh, familiarities with government uh, uh, here to Washington. Uh, what you what you really need, though, to be a to be a success, is uh, the ability to understand what a constituency is saying to you. And as I said earlier, how how people, given enough information, can can honestly change their mind, change uh, change their advice. And I one very interesting thing that, that's happened to me since I've been in elected office. Uh, I have a much greater respect for the average person than I had before. I used to think when I was an average person, so to speak, that uh, the public could be led around by the nose, so to speak, by glamorous politicians or by you know, some con jobs and so forth, and that all you had to do was spend a lot of money on television advertising, and you could, you could con them into anything. That isn't true. Uh, only time we fail as a people is when we, we don't have all of the facts. So uh, given enough information, the, the instincts of, of the ordinary person are a lot better than the instincts of, uh, of a lot of people that make a profession out of, out of political life. Do you ever run into difficulty with the matter, with the fact that people should have elected you for your judgment and your ability to weigh the facts rather than to uh, respond immediately to their dictates? I know a lot of people find that a difficult differentiation, don't they? Uh, yes, and a lot of people try to draw lines between, uh, you know, what if, what if you think one thing and your constituency thinks something else? Mm -hmm. uh, and I say, I've, I've never really been faced with that. And, and uh, if I had all of the communications tools that I, that I wish I had to communicate with four million people, I don't think I ever would be faced with that because the biggest drawback between my voting the way I think I should vote and, and the people's perception of how I should vote is that I have a lot more information sometimes than they do. And if I could get all that information out to them, I suspect that we'd probably come down on the same side of most issues. And, that's the frustration, being able to inform and, and, and educate people. you have any particular pet bills that you're going to be working on in the months to come that you want very much to see passed? I have a lot of them, and, but, but weaving through all of them is, is, a, is a basic philosophy that says my job here for some period of time, not a lifetime, but for some period of time, is to do things differently and to do them better uh, than anyone's done it before. And so, uh, in the area of health care, for example, I am, I am the uh, author of the chief uh, uh, piece of legislation to change uh, the health care system in this country, uh, uh, not to turn it into a governmental system, but to, to go back to, uh, to private health care in a competitive uh, environment. Uh, I'm trying to do this same thing in, in a variety of other issues, and energy issues, and, and uh, uh, to, to be more reliant on individuals and, and their private institutions to deliver public services because I know that's that's where it's at. Governments have the test and, and government's role is going to change. I know it's been a long, busy day and we thank you for giving us the time to spend with you, the Dernberger family. It's been a very, very pleasant visit. The, a portion of the Dernberger family. <laughs> to those back in Minnesota, they miss you here. <laughs> Thanks very much, Senator. Thanks for and coming thanks out. For Thank you, David, Thanks. Thanks. On the Sunday movie on four, James Coburn plays a maverick doctor. You give me five minutes, friend, I'll lay you open from chest to crotch, resection your colon, alter your sex, and sew you up with the laces out of my shoes. Watch him operate as he goes to Boston to bust an establishment hospital wide open. I've been conducting a little investigation. James Coburn with Jennifer O'Neill out to solve a murder on the Kerry treatment. The Sunday movie on four. Every evening we play favorites. Alcoholics Anonymous organizations in the Twin Cities are now offering a weekly AA meeting for the hearing impaired and the deaf. 
For more information on alcoholism, a weekly meeting will be held at the Prince of Peace Lutheran Church for the Deaf in St. Paul. If you'd like to know more about the program, call 874-1447 in Minneapolis, 776-6566 in St. Paul, or TTY 221-3761. Last weekend, I attended a special premiere, or a special preview, I should say, of a motion picture called Coal Miner's Daughter in Los Angeles. It's the life story of singer Loretta Lynn. Uh, we'll be talking with Loretta Lynn and her husband, Mooney, on next week's program, and we'll also be talking to the two people who played the parts of those two people in the motion picture, Sissy Spacek, who plays Loretta, and Tommy Lee Jones, who plays the part of Mooney Lynn in Coal Miner's Daughter. We hope you plan to be with us next week for This Must Be the Place. Have a good week. We'll see you then. I'm Robert McNeil. In the last episode of Edward and Mrs. Simpson, Wallace finally realizes that Edward must choose. Either you can have me or the throne, not both. You know that too. So I'm offering to back down and leave you the throne. Join me for this dramatic conclusion, Edward and Mrs. Simpson. Edward and Mrs. Simpson, Wednesday night at 7, here on Channel 4.